December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The American people will fight with a relentless fury which will drive the ancient Teutonic gods back cowering into their cave. President Roosevelt is dead. The president died of a cerebral hemorrhage. So help you God. So help me God. We often ask ourselves on what could have been. On April 12th, 1945, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt passed away due to a cerebral hemorrhage. His death came during a crucial point during the Second World War with many key conflicts finally coming to a head. Taking his place as Commander-in-Chief was Harry Truman, the then Vice President. The Missouri native had only been VP for three months and hadn't been briefed on the atomic bomb. Many critics argued that he should have never became President solely because there was fundamentally a better person for the job. You may now know Harry Truman as the man who guided the end of World War II, but few people tell the tale of his predecessor, the man who was destined to become President president but lost his chances due to a coup from within his own party. Seemingly forgotten by time, this is the story of Henry Wallace, a champion of the working man and the 33rd Vice President of the United States. Let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. FDR is the only president to have three terms and would have served a fourth had it not been for his declining health. During his first term, his VP was John Nance Garner, who described the position as not worth a bucket of warm piss. In fact, he dubbed it the worst damn fool mistake he'd ever made. Harsh words, I know, but it was true. The Constitution only mandated two duties for the vice president. One was being able to break a Senate vote by being the tiebreaker, and the second was to confirm the winner of a presidential election by counting the electoral votes. Not only that, but the vice presidency was seen as relatively unimportant and wasn't even a mandatory position in the executive branch until 1967. One of the things you gotta Go address, what yourself, do you, Mr. King. You gotta so why would someone want to become vice president? Well, for one, it can be used as a springboard during the election, but also, if the president is ever removed from office, they get a promotion. But let's put the basic civics knowledge aside. In the 1940s Democratic Convention, Henry Wallace put his name into the ring for FDR's vice president nominations. Although he was a corn farmer from Iowa, he had a mindset 20 years ahead of his time. He was known for his positions promoting civil rights and desegregation. Also during the New Deal, he helped promote Roosevelt's social programs as the Secretary of Agriculture. So him and FDR saw each other eye to eye, and FDR chose to endorse Wallace as his running mate. Even though FDR was in support of Wallace, it wasn't necessarily smooth sailing. It was still up for the convention to vote for his candidate. Democrats from the South sharply opposed Henry's positions as they adopted more conservative values. Nevertheless, the duo still ended up together due to Roosevelt threat to not accept the nomination entirely if they didn't vote for his running mate. Once it was official, the duo easily won the 1940 election. Henry Wallace was the most progressive vice president during his tenure, and what he did as vice president transformed the office for decades following his departure. When the United States entered World War II, Wallace was directed by the president to convince various countries in Latin America to declare war on Germany. In a short time period, he managed to convince 12 countries to join the war effort against the Nazis due to his sheer charisma and personality that he managed to display while he visited the areas. I mean, this man was simply charming. Just look at his slick hair, arguably the most handsome VP we've ever had, but that's besides the point. On May 8th, 1942, Wallace used his position as vice president to deliver one of the most underappreciated speeches in American history. It was about the potential aftermath of World War II, and what the status quo would be. He flirted with the idea that imperialism should be abolished, and that the century following the war should be one for the common man, not just America, but all individuals across the planet Earth. Above all, he promoted equality and the rapid advancement of civil rights. In 1944, Henry Wallace toured the east of the Soviet Union at a time when the United States was allied with them. FDR had made talks with Stalin about how they would dictate post-war Europe, and Stalin reluctantly agreed to Roosevelt's terms. Stalin's mindset was that as long as FDR and Wallace remained the leaders of the United States, then perhaps peace talks would continue to persist and lead to a more open-minded future following the war. However, during the Democratic Convention of 1944, the beginning of the end of those peace talks took place. The conservative Democrats who 
heavily despised Henry Wallace and his progressive ideals, decided to form a coup within the party to ensure that Wallace would not get renominated, despite Roosevelt's wishes. Wallace came into the convention with a 64% approval of being renominated, while Harry Truman was trapped at a painful 2% on being nominated. So how exactly did Truman manage to grab the nomination as vice president? Well. This is how he did it. First things first, the anti-Wallace elites made deals with delegates to promise certain ambassadors to be appointed, and certain payoffs were made. They wanted to do everything within their power to stop Wallace and his progressive mindset of a world of racial equality. To put it bluntly, human greed and corruption paved the way for Harry Truman to be nominated, and in a way, it also paved the way for Truman to become the 33rd President of the United States, following Roosevelt's death. This position could have been Wallace's, but due to sheer hatred of what he stood for, it wasn't. The establishment had called the shots. Roosevelt felt deep remorse for Wallace, so he appointed him as Secretary of Commerce in March of 1945, as he still wanted him in his White House. In reality, Roosevelt didn't really care about Truman. Truman was really forced upon him by his party. Truman had only met Roosevelt two times while as vice president, and once Truman did become president, no one had bothered to tell him before that the United States had developed a top secret weapon of intense power. When Truman was told about the power of the atomic bomb, he bragged about the weapon repeatedly during the post dam conference in July of 1945. Truman reportedly bossed people around during that meeting, acting high and mighty, turning Stalin and Churchill off by his childish demeanor. For Stalin, his response to this new leadership was unbearable. The peace talks following the war would lead to a cold war as Stalin grew a larger mistrust towards Truman and the United States. The atomic bomb was eventually used on Japan and Truman relished in his victory against the Japanese. As for the man who could have been the potential leader of the free world, he was fired by Truman and labeled as a communist due to his ideals. Truman had asked Wallace to be more fierce on attacking Russia, but Wallace opposed the whole idea of escalating tensions with the Soviet Union and instead promoted for peace. Peace was completely off the table for government officials at the time, so he was shown out the door by Truman. At once, one of the most popular men in America. He was lampooned into one of the most hated. He was forgotten by history and had his reputation tarnished due to his belief of a safer world. It's at points like these while I'm studying American history when I wonder what if Wallace managed to snag the nomination of the Democratic Party in 1944? What if he had managed to succeed Roosevelt? How would he have handled the end of World War II? Is it possible that peace talks would have continued to flourish? Would Wallace have led the United States into a different path for the rest of the 20th century, rather than the one filled with nuclear anxiety? Who knows? All I know is that Wallace was cheated out of something he deserved, and that very single thing was a turning point in history that could have advanced politics far into the future at an earlier time. We shall fight for a complete peace, as well as a complete victory. The people's revolution is on the march, and the devil and all his angels cannot prevail against it. We who fight in the people's cause will never stop until that cause is won.